Murphy has sponsored the Divide exhibit and has showcased this work here for this semester. Um, the panel today is going to be discussing all of these issues with mass incarceration and we're very fortunate to have uh, a number of people joining us today. Um, we have Raymond Thompson first, uh, who mm -hmm. is the artist and creator of the Divide installation. Uh, we have Jerry Kirby next, who is the assistant professor at Fairmont State University in <coughs> criminal justice. She's also a facilitator for the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program. Uh, next, we have Jennifer Oliva, who is an associate professor of law and public health. She's a director of the Veterans Advocacy Clinic, where her clinic represents justice-involved veterans. Uh, Next and finally, we have Rich McAllister, who's a founding member of R0, which is a re-entry focused nonprofit that is based here in Morgantown. Um, and I'll give a more detailed uh, introduction for each of these panelists before they come up and speak. But these are the panelists we're fortunate to have here. And we want to give particular thanks to first Assistant U.S. Attorney uh, Betsy Jivenden. Without Ms. Jivenden, we would not be connected. We would not be half as productive as we've been over these past years. It is really thanks to the support of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of West Virginia over these past years and their incredible work on reentry and in making sure that we can decrease recidivism and focusing on that connection that we see a reentry office at Hazleton that's doing greater and greater work that we see inside out flourishing. Um, they have been a key part of this and uh, I am not the only one who is deeply appreciative to um, First Assistant U.S. Attorney Betsy Jiminen. Uh And um, thank you for attending and for all of your work that you've done. Um, I, would like to, <laughs> I would like to begin uh, by showing a clip from the Marshall Project's new video project called We Are Witnesses. And the clip interviews a woman, Ayanna Thomas, who was incarcerated for 36 months. And she discusses her own separation from her children uh, and her own incarceration and then um, what she's tried to do since her reentry into the community. My name is Ayanna Thomas Bazil, and I was sentenced to 36 months in a federal prison, and my charges were bank fraud and conspiracy to commit money laundering. My husband did some illegal business, and I took some of the money out of his account and put a check into my own personal account. And I didn't actually commit the crime, but because I knew that the funds weren't legal and I profited from it, I also got charged with my husband. I think if I was Madoff's wife, I would have went to Connecticut and bought a house and sat my behind down and had a little bit of money in my account, been able to work or do what I had to do if I was Madoff's wife. But I didn't come as Madoff's wife. I came as Raymond's wife, so it was different. My son was 12 and my daughter was probably six. One morning they left for school, they came back and we were gone. My husband went in a year before me. We had got the same 36-month sentence. The first day is the worst day. You remember your first day and your last day. But the first day is the worst day. You get put into this dormitory for newbies with these um, bunch of women that you don't know. A few of the women interested in experience because they come in and they're like soccer moms detoxing off of the Oxycontins and they're throwing up and they're dry heaving and you're seeing them using the bathroom on themselves, they're throwing up on themselves. I'm looking over like, is this really real? Most of the women there were there for money and drugs and crimes committed with their boyfriends and husbands, but from all walks of life, white, black, Asian, um, everyone. The women are bonded usually by culture. Most of the Hispanic women are together. 
the Caucasian woman and there's the black woman. I kind of was like all over because I didn't really fit because my dynamic was that I was from Brooklyn, but I was a suburban mom. My best friend was a Caucasian girl. She had the husband, she was here, her kids were gone, my kids were gone. We had to go through the crime when you got report cards, when you got pictures, when you had visits. You have to have someone with you that helps support you through that because when you have a visit, you can't even get up the next day because it takes everything from you, like everything when your children are leaving you. We told my daughter that I was in the military. We said dad went to the military and mommy's gonna have to go too. Because if I sent her a picture, I was in my little green military suit. And when she saw me, I was in the green suit. There was one visit. She's like, well, I don't wanna leave. And I was like, well, Auntie Sarah has to take you back home. And you know, you're giving this whole story about why you have to go back. And she's like, Ma, I just want to stay here with you. I can like get McDonald's and we could just come back. Because she wanted McDonald's. And she's like, we could just come back and have McDonald's together. And I think, and that was the only time I think that I cried, my son cried. It was like awful. It was like you ripping her from, because she just didn't want to go. You kind of feel like a failure. And now you're failing again. And, um, it's rough. But we have our own place and we have stability and we stay where we are and we happy where we are. I did it. My son would help people within the area and within the neighborhood. So um, we're fortunate, again, to have Raymond Thompson here with his own documentation of, of this same issue. Um, and he's a, a freelance photographer and multimedia producer here in Morgantown. He works as the multimedia producer at WVU. Um, and he's worked as a freelance photographer for the New York Times and the Associate Press. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Thompson. Hello. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the, my project, uh, Justice Undone and The Divide. So basically, the Divide is a project that fits into Justice Undone. Um, the Justice Undone is the larger project that I worked on for about two years. Um, and that project mostly looked at the, you know, try to look at the impact of incarceration from the more of a family and child level. I wanted to show uh, essentially what happens if you take all of men and some women out of the community, what's left in that community basically. So, I went to several different places around the country to document um, essentially neighborhoods that have a larger impact of incarceration. Um, so the war on drugs has led to an incarceration of millions of people. Between 1965 and 2000, the prison population in the United States swelled by 600%. There are more than two million people who are currently incarcerated in the United States. My goal as a photographer is to pose questions that acknowledge the long conversation of the documentary image in the context of black life without falling into stereotypical trappings that have plagued images of African Americans to date. Um, the conversation about the causes, effectiveness, and solutions to the war on drugs is climaxing in the public sphere. I wanted these images to exist as a, a signal post to the collateral damage of the US policies have had on the agency of the black community. Um, so I was always struck by um, how you could sort of see in time um, the war and drug unfold in, in communities. One of the first things I did um, was to, when I started doing research for this project, my main um, source was the justiceatlas.org, which gave me, was able to give me um, numbers of, in certain states, to give me numbers that showed me prison admissions and prison admission expenditures, how many people being paroled in certain areas. Um, prison releases in certain areas, and able to, to pinpoint exactly where money was being spent on incarcerating people, 
and if I can find the places where most people are being incarcerated and most money is being spent, uh, and then I could maybe get a picture of what does that community look like by zip code. Um, also in the Justice Islands, it also broke things down by uh, household income under 25,000. Um, so poverty, um, non-white or Hispanics by race, um, the number of single parent and family homes and unemployment numbers were all found within this data set. So from there, um, when I was in, living in Austin, Texas, I found the Brown family. Um, I found a family um, led by Beverly Brown who live in a zip code 78702. Um, this zip code had incarceration rates five times higher than the average um, rate in Austin, Texas. The city had spent probably an estimated $12 million to incarcerate people from this zip code. And more than 70% of the people incarcerated in Austin would come from these two zip codes. So it was, it was suffering way more um, than other parts of the city. Oh, I'm skipping. Excuse me if I skip stuff around. So I wanted to show you guys, I wanted to take you guys here to this project. This is where I started with this project and sort of got the inspiration before it kind of ballooned out into a, the bigger, wider project. Um, so Beverly, like in her lifetime, all of her brothers have been incarcerated at some point and three out of her five children have spent time in jail. Um, Beverly told me the story uh, about how the first time her, one of her brothers went to jail, um, how they all had to, her, her dad and mom got in the car and went down to the Travis, to Travis County Center Jail to see him as they were taking him off to prison and how that sort of broke her heart and that was the first memory she had of one of her family members being incarcerated. Um, I'm gonna play, so you guys can hear her voice. I'm gonna play some audio here. I remember hearing my grandmother used the term generational curse. I didn't understand until I saw. Now my father or my grandparents and none of them never went to prison. Or but then when I saw my brothers go, and then they got out and then I, couple of them, their children went. And then I actually had two daughters that have been to prison. Yeah. And matter of fact, I have four children because two of my sons have been to prison. Uh, so in this story, um, I was trying to highlight the impact of prisons. I was, I was mostly looking to see, asking her questions like, so when did this start? It was the first time you saw people on your block start to go to jail? And she was able to sort of, you know, give me a timeline that sort of followed along with the sort of rise of the war on drugs from, um, from Reagan on to Bush to Clinton and to give me some numbers to help me understand like what this looked like on the ground at the time. Um, so she has three generations within her own family who have been incarcerated and you know, what does that look like? So I wanted to document her family and a little bit in the community. So I'm just gonna show you guys some pictures and talk about, this is just uh, a piece of prison correspondence that um, they use as Christmas decoration in her house at Christmas time. It says, uh, from your dirty boy. And they believe he's in like a white prison jumpsuit in the card. Um, Beverly's brothers have been or continue to be in and out of prison. Um, they get out and they have this tight family family life. But there's always sort of that thing weighing on the wall, like when when will they get in trouble? They're a little older now, but they still are struggling with the impacts of having a record and finding a job and just doing those basic things. This is a, a Christmas time gathering, Christmas dinner. Um, so the Beverly's role as a grandmother has also been extended because she's um, her prison, our, our, her family, her, her daughters and sons are in and out of prison so much, um, which has basically you know, caused strains between her and her <coughs> children and then her children and their children are also strained in a way because they're also, her, her daughter has um, been in and out of prison for drug addiction, various things, and Beverly has ended up raising some of her children. Um, Beverly's son, who's sort of the, the, the silhouetted figure in this photograph, is also was selling drugs from the house while I was there. 
um, it's just you can just see how things are repeating over and over again. There's one more piece of audio to play you. I watched my mother die, praying for God to let her live to see a drug and alcohol free generation that would not be going in and out of jails and prisons. Needless to say, it did not happen. So then I took up her prayer. Well, I'm 64 years old now, so I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I kind of think I'm not going to live to see it either. So we're going to the next section in the project, which is the, just the Justice Undone project, which was shot in New Orleans. Um, some of the stuff is in Texas, Washington, D.C., and just down the road in Kremlin, Maryland. Um, this first image is a photograph from the, they call it the, the, juvenile, the juvenile justice facility in New Orleans. Um, this area actually had been flooded during the hurricane. But they had built, um, it sort of struck me that they had built a basketball court um, out there and they let, let kids sort of be out and looking almost a natural environment and you would notice the, the fence lines that are actually incarcerated within this facility. This image here is from Washington DC uh, uh, at a car wash for friends and family of incarcerated people. Um, a lot of these photographs, I, I tried to find organizations that were do, was doing work to work with children who were, had incarcerated parents um, who were trying to provide support. Um, I didn't just want to focus a lot of time on poverty images and just showing how poor some of these faces are. I wanted to find some hope in them and see people who were sort of struggling to regain some of their agency. But at the same time, show you know the hardships of living in a poor neighborhood. Um, Right before a group of kids were about to go in a car wash, so one of the counselors discovered that you know someone had broken into their car and stole, or I think it was a CD player or a Walkman out of it, and sort of the children sort of reacting to what had happened. In this image, we sort of return back to that juvenile justice center in, in New Orleans and sort of looking at the graffiti on the wall and noticing, thinking about how many children have spent time within this, this box. And there's a lot of detail in there. Another organization in Austin, Texas, like the, um, uh, the African American Harvest Foundation in, in Austin, Texas, uh, sort of works with children who have been recommended from the court to have had, who've gotten arrested or getting a ticket or something in school and had to go to the courts to sort of you know, be in a program which would help them give them basic skills. This young man is like learning how to tie his tie and I think they're doing some arithmetic. And down the street in Cumberland, Maryland, there is a, a family, there's a program called Hope House out of Washington, D.C., which reconnects um, children who have incarcerated fathers at the, um, forgive me for not remembering the prisons that are in Cumberland right now, um, <coughs> at the prison over in Cumberland, and they would bring children from there over for a week to spend time with their dads. And this is uh, like a, they're, they're doing like the very last day of the, the very last day of the camp. They had kids, you know, do like a, a, a father, father children dance there. Um, uh, friends and family of incarcerated people also will take children out uh, out of their environments in Washington D.C. out into the woods to sort of to um, spread knowledge, to do little teach-ins about what's going on in their neighborhood. I actually have a video of that in a second. Um, and sort of back to Austin, Texas, and looking at you know, the impacts of the children didn't have anything to do, so they would go in the woods and smoke weed. But I imagine that this also was happening in upper parts of, you know, the less, where there wasn't as much enforcement happening in Austin as well. Um, but the impacts for these kids are, are greater if they're caught. And since there's more enforcement in these areas. Um, yeah. And again, just sort of, always wanted to keep in contact with the people, with children's dreams and the fact that they wanted to do something more with themselves. Um, this is Chelsea and her dad was in and out of prison for a long time. And I just really wanted to focus on the fact that she was moving forward and trying to deal with what was happening, like living in a poor neighborhood, dealing with the fact that her dad wasn't there. So I'm gonna play a quick video for you guys about the friends and family of incarcerated people. 
um, just to get an idea of sort of that nonprofit trying to do something to help you know, deal with the situation. Project we weekend. We weekend. Like Everybody you. saw the Matrix, like and so the Matrix was all about Neil unplugging himself from the system. And so we liken what we do to the Matrix. We've unplugged these youth from the system. We focus on at-risk youth, and what I mean by at-risk youth is youth that live in damaged areas that create pathways to prison. And we brung them out here to an environment which is a bit foreign to them, but it should be it should be natural. They should have an appreciation for the earth. They should have an appreciation for the sound of the water that we can hear in the backdrop. So this is an opportunity for us to bring a group of youth out into semi wilderness and let them explore and uh, add to their understanding of the world we live in. But we also make this process a holistic process in that we try to give them survival skills for when they go back to the communities that they come from. Those are the rights that you have that you can literally file charges against the public service who are supposed to be protecting you. And if they violate the law, they are as guilty of, 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 of offenses as anybody else. I woke up out of my sleep and I've been downstairs. Oh, then I'm going to send guns pointing at some kid. I'm like, whoa, hold up. What is going on? The neighborhoods they live in, each one of these neighborhoods are the same. There's a high volume of drug trafficking. There's a level of uh, prostitution. There's a high presence of the occupation of officials of the state. And so these children are faced with the trauma of that. They don't even understand it. They don't even know what it is. And it'll be a long time down the road before they realize that that's what got them kind of thinking and operating like they are on survival mode. The world that these children live in, the suffering that they are basically exposed to, dictates to them that they become a certain type of person. And so they are projecting the images that their environments are impending upon them. What family and friends of incarcerated people are seeking to do is to get them out of those boxes. I want them to be able to see and think of themselves as having a greater ownership in the community, a greater ownership in the city, a greater ownership in the region, a greater ownership in the world so that they want to protect the world. So part of why family and friends bring these children to Wayside is so that they can slow up, pump their brakes, if you will, open their minds, think a little bit, and start thinking about the boxes that have been created for them and how they can wiggle out of them. Finally, we get to the divide, which is um, the images that are out in front of the law library and um, from the images that are down at the WU library. Um, so let's read you the project description. Um, volunteers organized the van trip for families of inmates incarcerated at Red Onion State Prison and Walden Ridge State Prison, which are located near the border of Kentucky and Virginia in Wise County. The Supermax prisons are approximately 31 miles apart. Uh, most of the people making a trip are from Virginia, urban centers like Washington, D.C., Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, Richmond, and Roanoke. Incarcerated men and women do not serve their time alone. The impact of their incarceration reverberates back to the communities in which they were removed. Most inmates are incarcerated more than 100 miles from their homes. The barriers to visiting an incarcerated loved one can be high. According to a study published, by the crime, by, published in Crime and Delinquency, the average inmate will receive 2.1 visits over the course of their entire sentence. 
the combination of distance, lack of transportation, missed days of work, and organizing childcare can be too much for some people to overcome. For inmates, not receiving visits while incarcerated can have collateral, um, collateral consequences that may damage social ties to family and community. Um, so with this story, I, I wanted to sort of, you know, this is just a glimpse of looking at the experience of traveling for some of the people who are in this story anywhere from 200 to 500 miles um, to see a loved one. Um, so we, I met the, the van, all the people gathered in Richmond, when they either came from, they took buses from Washington DC or dropped off by family members there. We gathered and we each hopped in the van and drove from Richmond, I think it was about a nine hour drive um, overnight to arrive first thing in the morning for visitation. So I'm just gonna click through. It's the image of Route 81. This is Bonnie Turner, and she's in Chesapeake, Virginia. And she had traveled over 460 miles to see her loved one. Um, her son has been incarcerated for 18 years, and it's been two years since her last visit. And I'm gonna play you an audio clip that um, Savory Ryerson, the radio producer, made. In two weeks, she's gonna be in town, and she's, we're gonna be doing another group presentation about that project specifically, but a lot more of it is gonna focus on some of her, of her work, which is really, really good. I recommend come if you can. When he came in the room, his face, he just put his hand over his eyes, and we were so excited. So I, I didn't want to cry, and I didn't want him to cry. It was just so, um, just so exciting to see his face, you know, because he's, he's been locked up for a long time. Uh, he was 23 when he first got locked up, so uh, he's 41 now. I think it's been like 18, maybe 19 years. Being in the visitation room, I just wanted to sit there and hold his hands. But, you know, uh, w once they come in, we can only hug them once they come in. And we can only hug them when they leave. But uh, being me being a mother, I just want to sit there and hold his hand. But um, they have a petition that we can't touch them, uh, no leg touching or anything. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of hard, but it's okay because they can't stop me from watching them. So I watched him, and he watched me and the rest of the family that was there. So it, it, never, it never gets easy. It's, it's always harder. But we just try to, uh, I just said, so we just try to make it so that we can still love and enjoy him when we see him. Because we never know when we're going to see him again. I said it was a very long trip, so most people slept in the bus overnight. This is this is Pamela Miles from Richmond, Virginia, and she had traveled 350 miles to see her loved one. Her last visit was one year from the point when this picture was made. She was worried about her son has uh, autism and ADHD, and she was always worried about bringing him to see the prison because um, it could. If he, if the son broke the rules, if there's something incorrect in the visiting office, there's a possibility that they would cancel the visit. And after making such a long, arduous journey, um, some interesting about Red Onion and Wallens Ridge are both were built on um, mine reclamation sites, so strip mines. So the, the landscapes there are very specific, very sort of. Some of you guys are familiar with strip mine sites; they have a certain look to them. Some images along the journey. This is, oh my God, I got this. I apologize, I didn't write down her name. But this young lady um, was from Washington, D.C., and she had traveled over 500 miles to reach Red Onion to visit her son. Um, the last time she had seen her son was 15 years. Um, and she's only seen him twice in 21 years that he's been incarcerated. My name is Leslie Gardner. I'm from Washington, D.C. I traveled over 400 miles to Red Onion State Prison to visit my son, Michael Gardner. He's been there for like 21 years. I've only seen him maybe twice. I haven't seen him, it's been like 15 years.
Yeah. And I seen him come through the door. I, I still know him. I know my baby. <laughs> and he still looked the same, just gained some weight. He looks, I said, you are so handsome, boy. <laughs> he just looks so good. And I was just so happy. I've been happy all week because <laughs> I knew I was going to see him. We shared some tears. You know, he said, hey, I want to go home. I said, I need you home, too. Some more images from along the way. This is Louise Good from Hampton, Virginia, who traveled over 430 miles, and it was three, three years since her last visit. My name is Louise Good. I'm from Hampton, Virginia. I traveled 430 miles to get here to see my son. To be able to physically touch him has been over 10 years, and today it was wonderful to touch him. He smiled and just hugged me, you know. And before I got there, I shed a few tears because I hadn't seen him in a while. It felt good, you know, to touch my son and to look at him with no petition between us. It felt real good, real good. It's nothing like touching a child, you know, that touch. Double exposure image from the entrance of Walden Bridge Prison after driving all night. It's an image of the gate or the fence at Walden Bridge Prison. This is um, S.A. Mains, and she's from Roanoke, Virginia, which is probably the closest to these prisons. Um, and she traveled 180 miles. an image in the uh, Walden Switch parking lot. For good behavior, the um, inmates often get, um, I guess, certificates for photographs if they're good for a certain period, like a year. They're able to get photographs made with their loved ones when they can visit. And this is a, a double exposed image of the front of uh, Red Onion Prison as we pull into the parking lot there. And been talking for 23 minutes over my time, so thank you <laughs> for listening. is Dr. Jerry Kirby. Uh, she's an assistant professor at Fairmont State University in the discipline of criminal justice. Her area of expertise is in correctional policy and prisoner reentry. Uh, and Jerry is a trained facilitator and federal coordinator for the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program based out of Temple University. And that's what this webpage is. So if you'd like to learn more about the program, um, we have an undergraduate group that is involved. Um, it's a, and I think there's involvement with a couple of the federal prisons around here. So this is a web page where you can find out more and about how you can be involved as well. Uh, Jerry is a co-founder and a member of the Circle for Hope Hazelton USP Think Tank, uh, which is incredibly innovative, just started, and uh, I believe the group has actually gotten some um, inside awards from Hazelton for what they've been doing. And finally, Jerry's also a member of Convict Criminology, which is a group of formerly incarcerated offenders who work in higher education to bring a new perspective on topics surrounding prisons and incarceration. Thank you, Professor Kirby. Check yeah. Or no? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I can move I'll that. Set my stuff on top of yeah. it. I brought my clock so I can like figure out how long I'm gone here. <laughs> um oh you're fine. This will work. All right, thank you. I wanted to thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. I wanted to thank Betsy Jividen for all the support she always does give all of us and me personally as a friend and 
you know, more than you could ever dream. Um, I also wanted to thank, thank Mr. Thompson for bringing such beautiful images out um, so people can't turn away from it. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to start with what I may not need to and throw out some war on drug stats uh, because I want to talk to you about what got me fired up. Um, basically, you know, the, with the start of war on drugs, we had an 1,100% incarceration increase over the series from the start, from the time it uh, started to the time it, end, you know, well, <laughs> the debate whether it's ever ended, right? Um, some things that I find really interesting is that, you know, the war on drugs was this, what was the words, the uh, American crisis, uh, public enemy number one, and, and, you know, in the 1990s, um, there were 79% of all drug arrests was for marijuana. You know, it wasn't even the drugs that they were really supposedly targeting. Um, but what did, who and what did get targeted was minority groups. You know, in, in our system today, we currently have more young black men incarcerated than we have in college in this country. And uh, the fastest growing rate of incarceration is women right now in this, in this country. Some say it's dropping. And they can say that because it's 1.3%. I don't know if I take that as a big victory. So yes, I'm very, I'm very critical. <laughs> and I could stand up here all day and be very critical about it, but I will not. So what got me fired up is that in 92, I was also incarcerated. Um, I did just over two years in a federal system for a drug charge. And I don't want you to think that I'm mad because of my charge, because of my time, my incarceration. Honestly, you're not gonna ever hear me complain um, about my sentence. But what I, what I am mad about is the 18-year-old that I met on my way out uh, that was gonna serve 20 years for a conspiracy drug charge because she was just with the wrong people at the wrong time, basically. And I'm also mad about the life sentences, you know, that we've issued out to people. Um, some for nonviolent charges, you know, no violence whatsoever, and they're doing double life. Uh, so I just wanted to put in perspective what got me fired up. Yeah, I have a lot of, you know, a lot of schooling, a lot of education, can't, could never seem to quit till finally last year. <laughs> Um, but I also have an inmate number, 147860018. I just celebrated 23 years free this in October, mid-October. But there's some things that you'll never forget, and your inmate number is definitely one of them. So uh, that's, that's, that's what got me started. And, and you know, um, the images, Mr. Thompson, that you, you have shown, it, it put in perspective, it took me back a minute because you know, my mother, my, you know, she's now, she was in her 50s at the time, but, um, you know, she used to travel five hours one way, one way through pretty mountainous, mountainous terrain by herself uh, and five hours back in one trip because she couldn't afford to spend the night anywhere <coughs> to see me. So she would do 10 hours of driving to spend about two hours with me. But she was there, and I was very fortunate to, for her to be there and be, be a support system for me. So yeah, I have to admit my first year incarcerated, I was a knucklehead. <laughs> I was, I was still very sh street thinking. I, I just engaging all about the thrill um, it, until one day I seen my mom and I seen what I had been doing to her. And that changed me, it changed me right there. And I stopped and I knew from that moment on that I wasn't gonna get out and, and just you know, get by. I was gonna get out and I was gonna fight. And that's exactly what I've done for 23 years now. Um, so I started school and I didn't quit. My mentor, Jim Nolan, you know, a lot of people know him, and he looked at me one day and he said, you're just gonna have to go until they tell you you can't go anymore, until they can no longer tell you what you can and can't do, and that's exactly what I did. So I finished my PhD. And now I'm gonna just tell them all kinds of things that they probably don't wanna hear. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but one thing that also, one thing about incarceration, reentry is very hard. And, you know, I could do a whole presentation just on the challenges of reentry. I always tell people, and it took me, it took me actually in this last, this inside out class I'm currently in, uh, something happened and it triggered, triggered in me, like everybody, somebody asked me, what's the difference? Like, how can you take people inside and really get them to understand what being incarcerated is like? And I don't know that I can because, you know, with individuals who have been formerly incarcerated or are currently incarcerated, I think the one thing that changes you and that is so different is the true lack of human compassion. Like, it, as soon as that first day, you know, uh, so, who, who was talking about the first day? Like, it, it, when you walk in there, it just doesn't exist. It doesn't exist from staff, and, and at the moment, it doesn't exist from the I individuals inside. So, I mean, if, if we can, I'm sh I've tried to imagine a place in general society where this lack of human compassion actually exists, and I, I, don't, I don't know where it just is non-present non than uh, your first bit of time in prison. You know, just, it, it, and the challenge with reentry is coming out of that environment into a compassionate environment and you're supposed to be okay. <laughs> that, that's very challenging. One thing that has helped me because the first, geez, 10 years I was out, I literally walked around, you know, as many people have done time and uh, do, uh, keeping my head down, hoping that no one really noticed me, right? Hoping that I just kind of stayed under the radar. Um, and then I found Inside Out, this program. And what it did for me, and I, what I believe it does for a lot of people, is it gives them a community. Because you have a community before you go in, it might not be the most positive community. You have a community while you're in, because you know one felon can't look at another and, and pass judgment, right? So there's camaraderie that develops. Um, but when you come out, it, it's not existent. You know, uh, some family, but the majority of society isn't very supportive. Uh, in general. Um, but Inside Out gave me that community that I'd been looking for. They accepted me. They s no longer seen my history as a deficit, but an asset. Um, and it took me accepting that. And that's what Inside Out does for people. I just wanted to give you some short quotes of some students who've been through it. It's cracked me open. Life-changing true humanity, gives me purpose, it makes me feel alive. These are just some short quotes that, it, that this program has brought to people inside and out. Um, let me just give you a brief overview. In general, we take 15 to 17 college students inside to have class with 15 to 17 inside students. We don't use labels. You know, we, we drop the word inmate, we drop the word privileged college student, because <laughs> everybody has inmates, both direct, or, uh, labels, both direction, right? So we, we don't use labels. I'm, I'm very strong about that. Um, you take people who have lived it and people who have studied it, and you put them together, and amazing things happen. I, I, I have state troopers now that are texting me saying, I took your inside out class five years ago, and today, I stop for just one second. I stop for just one minute. I, I have people, I just got an email from a student took it four years ago and she's been going around doing presentations about the program. I didn't even know that. Like it does, it, it, it you know the word rehabilitation, big word we throw around, right? I don't buy it. <laughs> I don't believe in it. I blew my knee out a couple years ago. I went into therapy. I rehabilitated it um, because rehabilitation, there's, there's an, a belief that something was once whole, right? You know, so if we rehabilitate it, we can get it back to that whole. Well, I can promise you the majority, a, a lot of people incarcerated, they don't know what that whole looks like. They don't know what that whole society expects from them even is, right? A lot of people, you can't expect them to walk a path that they've never seen, ever. So what Inside Out does, it challenges ind individuals to transform. 
We believe in transformative thinking, transformative beliefs. I have a man in my class right now, uh, inside student that, you know, he, he says that, you know, he says, I don't know, I, I don't think I can go straight to transformation. He says, I'm, I'm in structure, <laughs> you know, I'm in structure. A and I think that's what Inside Out does. Um, Inside Out started in 1995. I should give homage back to the people who began it. Uh, Lori Pompa, she's the director, founder of Inside Out. Amazing woman. Uh, she doesn't even know it, is what's, what's phenomenal about her. She's kind of like mischievous. And, <laughs> and she, she actually started Inside Out with a tour um, to, to a prison. And she, at the end of this tour, she allowed the class to sit down and just have a conversation with some of the inside, you know, individuals incarcerated. And one of the guys, Paul Perry, um, came up to her after and said, wouldn't this make an amazing class? And she's like, huh. Yeah, I would. And it took her several years and a lot of development and uh, a Soros fellowship. But she, she, she developed it. And one of her first students back in Graterford Maximum Security Prison was Paul Perry, the original, where the original idea came from. Um, he wrote an amazing chapter in the Inside Out book called uh, Death of a Street Gang Warrior. And he talks very much about a story like I just said. Um, how, where he was before and how the judge told him he's a menace to society, just throw him away, and he did. At 19, he gave him life, and in Pennsylvania, life is life. And, uh, you know, now, the amazing things he's done. Inside Out recognizes it, and all the people recognize it, but, uh, you know, we, we like to push a lot of people away, most definitely. So, um, Inside Out, I'm on my 17th Inside Out class, actually, and it never gets old. <laughs> uh, Inside Out comes in many different forms. Um, I was just saying that uh, we should recruit Ms. Jividen or somebody to do an Inside Out class for the WVU Law School. I think it would be phenomenal. Um, we, uh, from Inside Out, there's always a final project. And just to show you the power of this bringing these two groups together. One of the final projects um, was this program called Bounce Back uh, that came out of the penitentiary. And it was a re-entry, development of a re-entry unit. And four years ago, it took, it went into uh, development and it took them years. These men worked tirelessly on development of every single class. And believe it or not, the, um, Bureau, Hazleton FCC just adopted it and are now, and now it's in play. The, and it was kind of funny because they tried to run it by themselves at first, didn't go so well. So they had to drag in the think tank, say, okay, guys, you, you run it. And, and literally, um, the think, or let me explain what a think tank is. Uh, at the end of Inside Out, you know, the, it's always like this. Well, we don't want the class to end. So now what do we do? <laughs> well, you do what you do, and I started a think tank. There's actually 22 now across the country. Um, we were the first one in a federal facility, first one in a federal penitentiary, first female think tank uh, that also started in FCC Hazleton in the country. Um, this group that we work with, Circle for Hope, uh, Ms. Jividen's a, a member also, and you should have seen that day when I told him I wanted to bring, uh, you know, <laughs> prosecutor in. That was fun, but they opened armed. <laughs> Open arm, most definitely. Pardon me? It took them a minute. But, uh, yeah, you know, what's amazing about this group is they work tirelessly on reentry, and half of them are serving life, you know, because they, they believe. You know, inside out, one thing I always say is that I'm going to put you in an uncomfortable spot in this program. I'm going to expect you to get really comfortable with it because that's where change occurs, right, when we go to that uncomfortable place. And these guys believe in reaching back and propelling forward. So every day, they're doing reentry program for their brothers that are being released when they're not. Uh, it's uh, very commendable, I believe. Um, other things that they've done is they've managed to get uh, reentry units in every single unit in the penitentiary, where there was one for 12 units, about 1,400 men. There was one inside out. These men got one, 12, 12 opened up, 
Operations Program. Uh, I, I think the one thing that I, I want to say is, is um, programming in general. You know, it, it does offer something. Uh, I just finished my dissertation on programming across the country. And what I found is that it does help, but we're not currently offering the right programming. You know, the things like GED, most definitely necessary, but uh, programming, states actually ranked very low when they're offering all these programs because it's not what they need. You know, in, in, instead of us sitting behind a desk and trying to figure out what they need, ask them. <laughs> ask them. You know, I, I got to meet Attorney General Eric Holder, and I was, I was like, ask them. <laughs> they know. I know what I needed. I know what my challenges were. Just talk to them. So why, in God's name, would I ever go back inside of a federal prison and work in the very place that housed me um, because that's exactly what I should be doing. And frankly, it's what we all should be doing. So, did I go over time? Perfect. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and a few years ago, the Appalachian Prison Book Project, uh, which is directed in part by uh, Dr. Katie Ryan, who's in the English department, had a symposium on education and prisons in Appalachia. And Dr. Kirby brought uh, members of the Inside Out class who were at Hazleton, I believe, um, to the symposium to exactly share that, to be able to ask them, what is it that people on the inside need? So thank you for all of your work. We next have uh, Professor, Jennifer, Associ Professor Jennifer Oliva, Associate Professor of Law and Public Health. She is the director of our Veterans Advocacy Clinic here at the College of Law. Uh, she's a graduate of the US Military Academy at West Point um, and is a veteran herself. And she and her students conduct trainings for incarcerated veterans who are at Hazleton. Uh, her clinic also represents veterans on criminal charges on the CVB docket in the Northern District of West Virginia. Uh, and she's been conducting research on service-connected entitlements for veterans who are incarcerated. Um, at least in my experience, veterans are um, not uh, as recognized in prisons or even acknowledged as people who are involved in the criminal justice system. Um, and I think there's a component of shame in that, uh, but there's more being done for veterans now. So I'm glad Dr. Oliva, or Professor Oliva can share that. Thanks for the promotion. And um, <laughs> these are tough acts to follow. These folks have done such great work. Um, I'm going to really try to keep my remarks brief. And um, I have two purposes uh, to speaking with you tonight. One is really to raise awareness about an issue that I can prove to you empirically, because great study work has been done really recently. Most Americans are dramatically undereducated about. And um, number two is to talk to you about some veteran stories uh, with Justice Involved Veterans with whom my students are currently working. Um, so we've heard a lot about how the United States is the sort of highest incarcerating nation in the world, and that's absolutely true. What I think a lot of people don't know is that uh, American veterans, who are about 6.6% .6 of the population, are uh, grossly overrepresented in the prison population, as Professor Beatty alluded. Um, we know. Uh, from Bureau of Justice, Justice Statistics that they're at least 10% of the prison population. I will submit to you tonight based on some factual analysis that um, we do believe that number is depressed because several state correction systems do not require inmates to be tracked by veteran status. They don't even inquire. So that's one reason why we, we know we're not capturing everybody. And the second thing is, even though the federal government does track folks this way for reasons that I'm gonna explain to you in a minute, which is stripping them of their benefits that they owned, owned, earned in service, which is why they track it, it's still a self-reported onus on the veteran system. Um, so anyone who doesn't wanna self-report for one of two reasons, shame, or I know for a fact when I report my incarceration, I'm gonna have my benefits stripped. Um, we believe the federal population is uh, under underrepresented as well there too. Um, so those are like sort of the overarching, my overarching big points. The other thing I wanted to tell you that is really interesting is that I think folks also know uh, that the American prison population is disproportionately two things writ large. Uh, people who are poor 
social, so, uh, socioeconomically disenfranchised, and people who are of color uh, and are minorities. Um, the United States military is actually raci incredibly racially diverse. It's amazing. It's, it's predominantly men, so for 80% men, but it is racially quite diverse as an American institution. Um, but what people don't realize is it's dramatically, um, disproportionately socioeconomically depressed people. Um, Douglas Kreiner and Francis uh, Shen did a wonderful law review article called uh, Invisible Inequality, the Two Americas of Military Sacrifice um, in 2016. It's uh, published in the uh, University of Memphis Law Review. And they talk about two empirical studies that they did in that law review article. One is, what is the socioeconomic demographics of the, the military? And it wouldn't surprise you to know that the military doesn't actually make you write that down on a form when you enlist or enroll, so they got crafty and got people's enlistment zip codes. Where were they coming from, okay? The second question they asked was, whatever we find out here, let's see what the public thinks. And they did a huge empirical study on what, how does the, what does the public think about the, the demographics of, of the military. So what we found was the most equitable war we've ever had was World War II. They went back to World War II and it was the most equitable war and things have gotten dramatically worse since the conclusion of that combat. Um, we, I think most people in here know this, but we used to have a draft in the United States, and um, as a consequence of the sort of ending of the Vietnam conflict in 1973, Congress enacted legislation to create an all-volunteer force. One of the concepts there was that Vietnam itself had been a lower class war with the deferment systems, especially the educational deferment systems, and that volunteerism would improve this. It wouldn't just be poor people getting drafted. As it turns out, if you actually look at the empirical data, which is largely what I'm relying on here, Vietnam was a middle class war, uh, and not, not a lower class war in the way that we think about it today. And each progressive conflict has become more and more of a poverty war, okay? And the worst one is the one that we've been in for the last 17 years. So that's what they found. Um, it's just gotten more and more um, disproportionate. And I don't think that I need to tell you folks, you'll sort of be able to put chicken and egg together here, um, people who pre-service had few resources and opportunities return usually to communities that look very similar to the ones they left, usually that very community that they left, right? So they, they're also facing post-service uh, inequality, uh, economic disenfranchisement, poor resources, poor mental health resources, access to health care. And that leads to poor health care outcomes, as we all know. So I wanted to talk about that. I have one quote for you um, about the Iraq War written by uh, a guy named Ronald Glasser. He wrote a book in 2006 that's called Wounded. And he says, quote, unquote, the Iraq War was fought without any sense of pretense of communal sacrifice. And that, quote, unquote, privilege spells the difference between living and dying, between being crippled and blind for the rest of your life. Today, once again, survival is a matter of class. <clears throat> So I submit to you that one of the reasons why we're seeing this escalating veteran population, it's, the numbers are just too close for me not to point this out, is, that we're, is, is due to these sort of factors. It's due to who we're actually putting in the military, who's paying the price. And the other empirical study I won't surprise you to find out um, is that most Americans don't know about this. They really believe that we are all sharing the burden. And that is grossly inaccurate. Um, so we're putting people in, this is who's, who's going through this, we put them sort of through hell, literally. Um, they come back here wounded, often with these invis invisible injuries that have marked these wars like traumatic brain injuries and post-traumatic stress disorder and the things like that. And then they get into criminal justice um, problems. I, that brings me to my next point. So we do two programs that were highlighted by Professor Beattie. One, of course, you won't be surprised here. We owe to First Assistant U.S. Attorney Betsy Jividen. When I first started working here, um, Betsy and Sarah Wagner, who's a, another wonderful human being and a prosecutor, <laughs> um, approached me and we uh, talked about doing a, a veterans treatment court model in the uh, Northern District of, of um, West Virginia here in Clarksburg. And they said, there's this really mean judge you've got to get past to get this idea passed and we'll see if he'll do it. And that's Judge Michael Alloy. And he sort of agreed on the spot with a lot of pressure from you. And every, um, the first Wednesday of every month, the students go and represent folks on that docket. And in fact, we did it this morning. And we picked up two gentlemen this morning. Now, how do folks get on that docket? How are, vet why are there vet a veteran's docket every, you know, in a federal, a fancy, fancy, beautiful building in a federal district court? Well, because um, if you're on federal property and you get a citation, you get a ticket, 
It's called a CVV ticket, and you actually catch a federal charge effectively if you plead to it and go and pay the ticket in court. So we had all these veterans who have been picked up for various offenses, some of which I'm gonna tell you about, at the VA while they were in treatment programs. They were issued a federal citation by the VA police, and most of them walk in and pay their 50 bucks, and guess what they have? A federal criminal record for the rest of their life. We decided that things could be done a little bit differently, and the judge agreed that if we supervise them for six months, the clinic students work with them, they go back, we re-enroll them in treatment, they, he'll actually dismiss the charge at the end of that period of time. We had a gentleman this morning uh, we're representing, he's a, a mid-70s Vietnam veteran who actually has shrapnel and bullets left in one of his legs and walks with a cane who has a substance abuse issue and lives in poverty. In fact, we today got enrolled him in food stamps was one of the sidebar things that we did after we picked him up. Um, and he actually was cited while in the substance abuse program for drunk and disorderly at the VA, in the VA hospital, in the emergency room where he had checked himself in. So that's, that was our first client. The other thing I'll tell you about him that was um, quite heartwarming and moving this morning, I think definitely moved the judge and the students, is that the judge said, okay, I wanna see you here in, uh, on, the, on the calendar next month, and this calendar starts at nine in the morning, every first Wednesday of every month, nine in the morning. And he said, sir, is there any way we could put that back later? And he looked at the judge and said, sir, is there any way we can put that back later in the day? And the judge said, well, that's when the calendar is. And he said, well, I can't get here before 10. And he said, why is that? He said, well, I live in Shinston. I have to take the bus, and the bus doesn't come until 9.30. So I can't get here until till about 10.30. And the judge said, well, how'd you get here today, Mr. McLean? And he said, I came last night. And he said, well, where'd you stay? And he said, I slept in the mission. So this is a guy to come to Clarksburg, came the night before, had to sleep in a homeless shelter, um, to, to make sure he appeared front and center in front of the judge, which he did today, to take his hits for exhibiting his substance abuse disorder in a substance abuse treatment program funded by the federal government at the VA facility. So that's my first story. Um, the second th program that we do that I want to talk about that I love is we do do educational programs and assist with some benefits at Hazleton Prison, and I have to thank the warden for, the deputy warden is a veteran, and we, we're really appreciative of the fact that we get to get in there and do that kind of work. And um, one of the veterans, I actually wrote about this in a, an article recently that I represented over there, who I'm, I'll call Billy, um, is a guy from Wood County, West Virginia, served two back-to-back -to -back tours in Iraq, uh, West Virginian, um, and was on his second tour, age 21, with his battle buddy when they tripped an IED, an improvised explosive device, and his battle buddy was Im immediately killed. Um, he suffered third-degree burns on his legs, uh, shredded his genitals, um, traumatic brain injury. In fact, I had to have both testicles removed, can never have children, um, and was in an egregious amount of pain. Um, they medevaced him back to Walter Reed in Washington, D.C., and eventually home. And while he was rehabilitating, of course, the VA put him on excessive amounts of pain medication because of the nature of his injuries. Um, until one day when the VA got criticized for overprescribing um, opioids to veterans. Um, and the next prescription he got from his doctor at the VA was um, yoga and acupuncture. Now, I like yoga, and I like acupuncture, <clears throat> but I don't have a severe physical disability, and most of my pain is self-inflicted. Um, so, uh, all right, uh, <laughs> his was not. Um, of course, that didn't go over too well with a guy who had been on these heavy medications for two years and rehabilitating from serious physical injuries. And he just snuck across to Pittsburgh, where the Pittsburgh VA was still prescribing them to some buddies of his that he knew, and he gets some pills and bring them back for some of the guys that weren't getting them from the VA here. He got picked up on a five-year drug trafficking charge, and um, his benefits, well, he was getting $1,400 a month um, for his disability rating. Um, the VA strips that down to $133 a month um, just for being incarcerated, even though it's not related to to your service. And the thing that I think is important to understand about that, I complain about this a lot, is that if you had been a police officer, if you had been a public official, if you were entitled to a public pension, or you're disabled in some other way, okay, the test when you go to prison is, 
do, to take the benefit is, is it related to that service? So did the, was the cop corrupt as a police officer? Not the guy retired, three years later he gets hooked on opioids and goes to Ohio and gets a bottle. Everybody with me on that? That's the test. That's the test for congressmen. That's why Jerry Sandusky um, from Penn State, who was a state employee, is still getting his salary, his pension benefits. That's why Dennis Hastert, um, you know, on the child molestation charges as a coach, and you know, still got his federal pension. All veterans for the, who have to, be honor, have to have an honorable discharge in order to get these benefits in the first instance, have them stripped on their 61st day of incarceration. It's a hard and fast rule with no assessment of any of the rest of these tests. So it's just piling on, piling on, double, triple punishment. So um, those are the stories I wanted to talk about. I really want to thank you um, for helping us get the program off the road. I will say this, we're the, there's only two um, federal districts in the entire United States that do this kind of diversion program that I was talking about earlier. One is in the Northern District of Illinois, which has the great city of Chicago, and um, Clarksburg, West Virginia. So um, we're pretty proud of that. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, our final speaker today is Rich McAllister. And after he presents, we're going to have an open Q&A. So um, please uh, come up to the mic and ask us questions afterwards. Uh, Mr. McAllister was born and raised in Washington, D.C., and he graduated from WVU, class of 2001, uh, in finance and management information systems. He started working with federal inmates on re-entry initiatives in 2014 and founded R0, which stands for Recidivism Zero, in 2015. Uh, he's going to be discussing their strategy for reducing recidivism. <clears throat> I got started. Yeah. You did? Cool. Hi, my name is Richard McAllister. Um, in some circles, I also go, go by 23520086. Um, that's a number that uh, <laughs> we, we both share a common history for. Um, so when people like Jerry, you know, and myself come up and say, you know, why would we ever want to return to a place that we had like such a weird, Unreal, like unreal experience. Um, it's for me. It's uh, when you see all the problems that could be so easily fixed just by some simple solutions. And I'll, I'll go over a couple of the ones that we do. Um, you're almost obligated to fix it. I mean, you'd be remiss not to fix it. So it's like, uh, you know, uh, I don't see problems as problems. I see problems as opportunities. And so when I was I, I did a little bit more time than Jerry. Uh, I did actually six years for possession. Um, but when I was there, uh, at first I was like, yeah, this is, this is weird. I mean, I, I was just doing my thing. And then um, I started to change. And so and as I changed as a person, I realized, well, I have a, a very unique opportunity. I can document everything that's going on and see from the inside what the problems are because the whole idea of fixing uh, crime or reducing crime or increasing public safety or fixing all these problems that are just so, excuse me, so obvious um, are right there in front of your face. And so this hard-won wisdom that I gained from it is what has propelled me and other people, some of which my colleagues that started R0 have effective life sentences, um, and uh, to create a sense of compassion in the place that doesn't have any compassion where we actually leverage uh, inmates helping other inmates. And we call them facilitators. We call the people who join R0 members. We kind of get rid of that stigma or that label. But it also, uh, we try to um, give people the courage to succeed. And we do that through allowing them to feel what success is by solving their problems correctly. So this is our organization. How do I click through it? Just to, I'll just scroll down. Yes, I have a degree in technology, but I don't know how to do PowerPoint. <laughs> Okay, down there. All right, I've been away for a little bit. Um, so, okay, scroll down one. So this is what an offender usually has as a timeline. You're sentenced and then you're released. And we spend a tremendous number of resources in the interdiction of crime. So we have investigation, we have arrest, we have prosecution. And then, um, and that's huge. I mean, that's where our, huge, our Department of Justice budget like, really uh, extends. And then we uh, warehouse people, I mean. <laughs> That's really, I mean, mass incarceration, 
What's wrong with it is because it's not mass rehabilitation, and I do don't like I don't like rehabilitation either. I, I don't like the word recovery either because I don't think someone recovers from drug use and goes back to where they were beforehand. I think you have to grow beyond it. So how do we grow beyond the criminal lifestyle? How do we grow beyond uh, criminal thinking, and how do we grow beyond some of the problems that get people put in jail in the first place? Well, we see that currently uh, all the reentry programs that exist are like triaging people. They are six months before you go home, you fill out some paperwork, you get some things done, uh, you know, you go to a class, it's supposed to be like three weeks long, but it's only two hours because it's really hot in the gym. Um, everyone gets their cards checked off, they enter it into um, the computer system and everyone's happy but no one's helped. Um, so really it's like putting a band-aid on cancer, it's, it doesn't make sense. Um, it's just really pretty. But, um, but re-entry is also not something that's automatic. It's not something that, oh, I leave prison and then I, I re-enter society. No, that's not true, it's like, it's, that, that's, that's fantasy. A re-entry is like possible, it's very hard, and it actually takes a very long time to prepare. And so what we have found is, um, didn't miss them? That we have a huge opportunity if we actually extend re-entry back to almost when the person gets sentenced. I mean, that makes more sense. Like, when you treat cancer, what do you do? You have different doctors, different disciplines, it's interdepartmental, it's integrated, it's holistic. I mean, that's how we treat those sort of problems. But when we deal with criminal justice, I mean, we just, we segment it. You know, we investigation, prosecution, warehousing, uh, probation at the end. And they're not integrated at all. And they're not also integrated with the community itself. So what we have found is that there's a huge opportunity to, to start because what's one thing that an inmate has a lot of is time. So we have found the more successful re-entries are when people actually plan ahead. So what are the kind of problems that people have? Um, well, first of all, one of the things that we found is that the current re-entry information book that they had available through the BOP was actually made by, uh, was it uh, Otisville or Raybrook? Raybrook, yes. And um, they had 294 different local re-entry service providers and their addresses. And we're like, okay, well, let's reach out to these people. So we fill out like a, a form letter that said, hey, I'm coming home to Oklahoma, blah, 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 please send me more information about your programs and services. Uh, out of 294 letters that were sent, um, we only got, well, 74% were never responded to. So three-fourths, no response. The other, the remaining percentage was 16 and 10, and 16 was actually bad addresses. And this book was only two years old. So 16% was delivery failure. The 10% that was left was like actual responses and only half of those responses made sense. So, uh, we actually considered a response that said, oh, we're out of business to being a, a one that made sense. The ones that didn't make sense is, uh, we don't help people from Oklahoma. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not in Oklahoma. <laughs> I'm coming home to Oklahoma. So, you know, if, if it was a nonsensical type of response, then it went into the one category. Either way, only 10% actually sent a response. And so if you imagine a person who makes 575 a month from their prison income actually takes the time and writes to an organization and says, hey, I'm coming home, I need help. And they get m like one eighth of the time they get a letter saying wrong address or three quarters of the time getting no response at all. Uh, that's just another added form of uh, disenfranchisement. And that is so, we saw that as being a problem. We said, okay, what are the resources available for inmates? Well, a lot of places have career centers or law libraries that have like these re-entry books and the BOP isn't putting out these re-entry books. Okay, these re-entry books are like, the information is old enough like to drive. I mean, they're like 16 years <laughs> old. I mean, like you go through it and you're like, wow, this doesn't even exist anymore. You know, so um, we looked at that and we said, okay, this is just ridiculous. And in the federal, the federal inmate population is actually the biggest prison population in the United States. We primarily just deal with the, the feds. Um, so, and their, their, their issues are a little bit more difficult than states because if you are in a West Virginia state prison, you're probably going home to Clarksburg. And so it makes sense, like things are gonna be local, people know what's going on, it's in the state. Oops. All right. um, but when you're in the feds, you have this huge gra uh, demographic distribution between where people are going. So you can never really have information to where people are going because you would need to have the whole United States at your fingertips. Well, we have the whole United States at our fingertips. It's called Google, <laughs> right? But people in the federal system do not have computer access. 
So what we did is we, we realized, okay, if you really want to connect people from prisons to the community, the first thing they gotta have is accurate information. I mean, if you don't have current contact information uh, for them to be able to reach out to, they're not gonna get it. So we built an app actually that's currently been launched um, that helps facilitate that. It's a free service. It actually interfaces with the Google API and it now enables federal inmates to go and to say, get resources for Washington DC and it populates multiple pages of contact information that's zero day searches. So it's when we see things like that, that we know that we can either leverage technology or we can be efficient or do something like that. It's a problem that we like to solve. The goal of what we're doing is not just to get people resources because like triaging people at the end of their sentence or helping them get resources is really not going to help them stay out of jail. The two things that all programming things need is one, you need to be able to change the mindset of the person. And number two, you need to create more opportunities. You need to enhance the opportunities that they have for the future. So if things like walking class might be good if you're unhealthy and you need to start walking around a little bit more, but it's really not going to help you get a job or it's not gonna help you find housing or it's not gonna help you do a lot of things. It's not gonna help really build your character or increase your virtue and like other parts of your personality that need to be created. So we see that the two key aspects for any sort of rehabilitation come from changing the mindset of the person and increasing their opportunities. So everything that we do as solutions has that. We also do a lot more than just reentry stuff. We actually use the reentry process to, as kind of like the carrot, <laughs> the carrot and the stick, you know, like if everybody needs housing, so we say, oh, we're gonna help you with housing. So they all come to our workshops. And so when they come to the workshops, you know, we sit with them, but the people who are the facilitators are also the same people that do the GED classes, that are the role models, that are the people on the compound that they go to when they need help or advice or, you know, need need someone who will give them something some information that they trust you know so um, we use that as kind of the conduit we say oh well do you have a detainer problem well we can help you with a detainer problem but we make them come and sit down with us and fill out we fill out the forms we forget we created the pro se motions but we make them do some of the work too so they have to go back and they have to photocopy the stuff and then mail it off and they get the stuff in the mail and the process takes six months to come to completion, we get like 98% of these things dealt with, or 95%, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's really like, for most part, because they're just easy things to solve, but instead of solving it for them, because a counselor can pick up a phone and just make this thing go away, just like that, but we don't think that that's efficient, or we don't think that really leverages the opportunity. What we do is we show them that there's a logical way to succeed, and what better way to teach them how to, like, do things the right way if they did it the right way and they get this, the feeling of success at the end. So we actually draw out the process so that someone can actually experience doing things in a logical you know, manner and a prescribed manner and actually how you should do it in real life. Um, so we really try to try to hit things that are on the cognitive level, the experience level, uh, things that will make people be more transformative, but we really don't even tell them that we're doing this because you know, sometimes it's just as better we don't tell them that we're trying to like give them therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we use we use the whole reentry resource acquisition and the and the navigating of needs, but our whole goal is really a transformative cognitive change. And I think with the inside out stuff, um, I was daydreaming while you're talking about stuff. I've heard of the program, but I didn't hear some of all the details that you had said. So Jerry and I are going to be talking a lot. I can tell you, and. Um, you know, that's what, kind of what R0 does, and that's kind of how we got to where we are, and that's where we're going, and yes, I met somebody we keep talking about here while I was in uh, Gilmer, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for someone like that who actually said, no, you're doing the right thing, keep, keep going, like, you know, if it wasn't for her and a couple other people, I wouldn't be up here today, so thank you very much for your time. Hopefully, we gave you some good insight onto things. Um, our, our website is r0.org if you want to see the search utility. It says re entry resource database. And it formats it into a very nice package. So like you can just plug in. Yeah, so this is what it looks like. So you got, for Philadelphia, they just plug in the zip code and then it goes through. And this actually would extend for about six more pages. But, <laughs> so I truncated it and just put the, put the um, categories. But, so we're doing QAs or what? Thanks. All right, so um, we have a great panel here who 
uh, all of whom are open to answering your questions. And I can also run around with the mic if that's less intimidating than going up to the mic. Um, so Hello. <laughs> uh, first, thank you everyone, this was incredible. Um, so my question is actually about uh, resources on the local level. So obviously there's representation you know, from the federal level, we've heard a lot about obviously nonprofits that are involved, um, but I, I'm, I'm missing, the piece that seems missing is sort of the involvement of the local governments. I know, so I, I recently moved from West Virginia to DC and I know that DC has an Office of Returning Citizens Affairs, but you know, is this something that's common or that's actually involved? Um, or is that one of the missing pieces of the puzzle? Uh, oh. And I'll just say this is uh, Professor Priya Baskarin who previously has done entrepreneurship work for returning citizens. Uh, I can, okay, so local re, uh, local reentry resources or local resources, it really depends on the city, right? Uh, Washington, D.C., Office of Returning Citizens. San Francisco, they got everything going on because San Francisco's great, I guess. Um, but then you get to other places that are, they don't have the resources, um, the priorities aren't there, and they don't have um, some places, you know, they, they like knowing that there's a second class citizen with a scarlet letter that is gonna be like always gonna be deprived. You know, like, like so there might be like some psychological things going on in certain areas that that would maybe even prevent something like that happening. But like you like you said, it, um, DC is uh, especially with the new mayor, uh, well she's not really new anymore, but yeah, yeah. So um, she's very pro like well she's just cool. I mean, <laughs> Like, I just have to tell you that. Like, uh, if I was in D.C., I would totally vote for her. Um, but she's very progressive, and um, so she fosters a lot of stuff. Uh, actually, one of the people on our board of directors got an award just recently um, uh, who was serving a life sentence and got commuted by Obama and now is doing some really great work. His name is, uh, uh, well, I call him Chuck, but it's, what is it? Evans? <laughs> Evans Ray, so, right. Um, but he is uh, in D.C. and he's been doing a lot of reentry stuff and he actually got a reward for her just recently for the stuff that's going on. So that is a very progressive city. Um, but like you are absolutely correct, when like the missing key is really connecting the community to the inmate or the person, or whatever, um, through the process of incarceration, because incarceration physically takes the person out of the community, but they don't need to be spiritually or socially or mentally disconnected from those or even family connections to the connections of the of the community because the the more you know kind of abstract things that you cut off and isolate them then it makes it that much harder for them to integrate and or reintegrate back into their community so um like philadelphia is another another place that has a lot of pro returning citizen stuff it so it really depends on the city and um and I, you know, I don't really know what West Virginia is. Other than what the stuff that we do, there's not many like returning citizens offices. So. I actually, um, <clears throat> someone said something about the really scary judge, Alloy. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just recently, in, in between uh, Ms. Jividen and uh, Dr. Diana Noon at Fairmont State, they've been saying for years, you two need to connect. You need, and he just actually walked up to me in the middle of lunch one day <laughs> And uh, he, he's doing some, and I, I think um, Ms. Jivenick could speak to this also, uh, progressive work with a new drug court down in Clarksburg. Um, they haven't even made it to the third phase yet. They're still in the first and second phase. And, and he is um, dragging me, uh, kicking and screaming, and uh, also Dr. Uh, Mandy Sanchez. And we're starting to begin to work with that court. I think what's different about this area in West Virginia specifically is rural. You know, rural areas um, are very challenged in regards to that. And, and frankly, um, you know, you have your DRCs, your Day Report Center in Morgantown. Uh, you know, the, the, the pieces of light that are out there, um, the challenges are very progressive with rural, rural problems. And, and I think um, Ms. Jividen in her office actually did a phenomenal uh, reentry uh, binder. Uh, we at W at WVU when I was there, we started it, and then Ms. Jividen took it and, and turned it into uh, something pretty amazing. But 
um, you know, so I, I think there's some resources out there. Uh, the way we did it was we looked specifically by problem, like housing, crisis, uh, food banks, you know, all of these things, uh, even though they're not a re-entry type program, there's what they are what's needed. And, and so getting all of that uh, in one place, you know, and, and the drug courts, I mean, with the opiate issue here in West Virginia, like it, it's just absolutely, uh, it's so needed, and it's so needed in more than just, it's needed throughout the state, most definitely. So, WVU Law School starting a re-entry place, that would be, <laughs> I'm all about it. You got my, you got my vote. <laughs> I just wanted to say that it goes to the point that was being made about, if you look at the demographics, right, like you're already coming from this, under-resourced, and you're going back to that. And the, the, the repeated use of the word cities is actually uh, yeah. meaningful here. Yeah. Um, so it, it is the cities that have the resources. We have people trying to get, I'm speaking of the drug court, people trying to get from Elkins just to participate or to go to the day report center and that's in that district, guys. And they just, you know, they can't, they have a tough time doing that and making it to work and stuff like that just because of transportation access issues. And this is a group of people that are working really hard to make this work. Right. Um, so it just kind of, and the second thing I want to make a point about is that one of the things I mentioned being naive uh, and not being a criminal lawyer, uh, and Betsy probably laugh about this, is that one of the suggestions I made to the federal uh, 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 supervised release facility um, was let's have a veterans mentoring group here. One of the things we know for sure works with veterans in treatment courts and in reentry is to have mentorship. So a similarly situated person that's been through stuff, and they threw the book at me saying, we don't want a bunch of felons to be, we're not gonna create space for a bunch <laughs> of felons to get together to chit chat. And they, don't, they actually, don't, they're not allowed to even um, communicate with one another. So when you want to talk about a group of people who identify that way, and we have empirical data that proves that having a mentor in the community that has that combat experience is incredibly helpful, and the veteran treatment courts have proved this, that is literally banned by federal practice and procedure. Yeah, when you're looking at a society that yeah. has every hundred, hundred to one have been incarcerated, uh, you know, the, the, I mean, the fact is, I can't eat, if, if I had a family member in Hazleton that was incarcerated, I technically would not be allowed to go visit them, uh, which is really ironic considering I go up there several times a week to teach. You know, so you know, some of the policies are so draconian and so back, way back. <laughs> you know, I mean, technically, Rich and I shouldn't be in the same room right now. You know, and, yeah. and <laughs> sorry if I caused problems, oh, it's cool. but you know, but that just Tolerable. goes to show how back, backwards everything is it's so far from current society. Hello, I'm Rachel Elkins at 2L, and um, my question is, I know we have clinics, and also um, undergrad has the opportunity to do the Inside Out program, but what could we as students get involved in now to help move forward? Because I feel like a lot of issues we might be able to deal with in the future when we're hopefully actually attorneys, but Right now, as students, what could we do other than clinic and potentially petitioning for an inside out program for law students? I, I think students have a lot bigger voice than they realize, and I think utilizing that, saying you want an inside out program here. Uh, at Fairmont State, we have it for graduate students and undergrad. You know, they can choose to take it if they choose. Uh, I, I think saying that, getting that out there and saying we want this, it, it would mean a lot. I actually just got just to show, to, to explain to you how diverse this can be, I just got asked um, in Pittsburgh Police Department, the chief of police is actually mandating that their new cadets that are going into the police department go through an inside out class. And I actually just got asked to teach uh, 15 police officers in Greene County Maximum Security Prison for an inside out class. I mean, me and police, uh, you know, but <laughs> but but I'll I'll I'm gonna take it on because that's what we should be doing. Uh, up at Howard University, they're doing millennials and police officers. You know, like an inside-out class. Like it, it can be whatever uh, vision you have. It, it's a model. It's like a car. You can take that car and dress it up however you want and create it how you, you'd like. Um, the other thing is we have three think tanks in Hazleton. You know, it's one thing I didn't, you know, plug as, as well as I would like to have. Um, you know, people don't realize, in less than 40 minutes down the interstate, you have almost 4,000 people locked up on that hill. You know, you, you've got about 1,300 
about 10 minutes from here. You know, a lot of people don't know that. They think when they're going down 68, they see all those lights, they think there's an airport there. No, it is a prison. <laughs> it is four prisons, actually. Uh, and we have, we have think tanks. Um, the Appalachian, Appalachian Book Project, I see some representatives back here, you know, they're always needing assistance. Uh, there, there's a lot of things, these reentry things that we're talking about, we need, we need help with them. You know, the GED programs in these facilities, you know, the, the inside population is teaching the inside population. Students scare away because they're like, oh gosh, I'm going to have to do math. It's eighth grade, you can handle it. You know what I mean? Like eighth grade level, you can handle it. Like there's so much you can do, to be honest with you. So much. Yeah, I was just thinking like, oh, I mean, we, we've come up with like tons of ideas. I mean, they don't even have to be like, what do you have to do with like, um, like the inside of the prison? Like one of the ideas I've been trying to get someone to do in Morgantown or in the city is actually create a, um, a day camp for kids that will teach them how to program. So instead of like going to summer camp that you would go to like play on a horse or whatever, you'd actually teach them how to make an app. So I mean that would be a good way to like, you know, and a lot of because a lot of kids, especially in the inner cities, like their fathers aren't there. They they go out and you know they, they do bad things like because they're not you know got somewhere to go. But you could actually create something that would be a place for them to go. So honestly, like there, there's tons of ideas out there. It doesn't even have to be with prisons. It can be with kids. It can like be like to help like others like. I would say just collect like some of your friends, sit around and say, well, what, how much time can we like devote to this and what are our resources already? And then you'll immediately find somebody who's like, yeah, I'll help with that. And it just, it'll just go. So like, I mean, we can give you ideas all day long, but it's really like, just look at your own social network and just, just do it. I mean, we didn't wait for the bureau to like, let us do our zero. We said, you know, we're just going to do it. Like we are going to help other people. Like if this is how we're going to do our time, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. And it just, then we got we're really successful, and then it was like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> like, well, you know, we weren't, we didn't wait for anyone to say that, like, yeah, go, it, it's okay, you can do that. Like, we just, we just started helping people with detainers. Right now, we have people in the rec yard, they're going out there giving them, like, trying to do child support modifications, like, because, like, sometimes our library space gets a, usurped for whatever reason. So it's like, just just do it. I mean, like, just if you have the motivation, just you'll, you'll find it, it'll just happen, so. Yeah, the reentry unit at Hazleton, I'm getting emails constantly saying, hey, do you know anybody wants to come up and do a one day workshop on whatever, fate, punctuation, <laughs> you know what I mean? Creative writing, like anything. So you, there's so many opportunities, um, parenting with the women, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Sanchez, she does trauma and victimization with um, uh, Inside Out, you know, in the women's facility. They need assistance. They're, they're doing their own workshops and healthy relations. There's, all you need is, if, if you need someone to walk in the door with you, follow me. I'll, I'll take you. You know, Miss Jivin and I'll take you. You know, we'll, we, we have the opportunities there. You just got to have the desire. I'm just going to take a little bit of a different spin on this, and I think the wardens from the, we have a large prison population in West Virginia, federal prisoners, uh, not to mention our own facilities. In fact, the fifth largest women's facility in the United States is in Alderson, um, so we have a significant, but what the wardens at those prisons will tell you is, wow, those folks at Hazleton and Morgantown are really lucky, because we have this school here that has all of this programming. We have Fairmont State, we have WVU, and we have all these groups. We have folks coming down from Pennsylvania. It's just in an area of the state. So if you're from uh, a southern county or from one of the more rural prisons that, that don't get volunteers, that weeks go by and no one comes there to put on programming because they're not in a big town and they're not near the flagship university in the state, they're not near these schools, um, it's getting a community group together to go and do you know, something once a month would be hugely meaningful to those wardens and they would embrace it readily. Uh, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I've heard that from them. them. I wish I could do that my program in the southern part of the state, but it's, it, we just, you can only do so much. That is really desperately where a lot of these resources are needed. Yeah, I, you know, we're going down to Concord College to try to get them into some of those rural areas, trying to get instructors trained with Inside Out. Um, you know, day, yeah, it's a day trip, road trip, let's road go, trip, you know, and that workshop will be so full you, you won't even know, you won't even believe what happened. <laughs> Uh, I'll also just point out that um, the ACLU is a nonpartisan organization that one of their focuses is criminal justice and the criminal justice system and policy work. And uh, Molly from the ACLU is right here. So if that's another interest. 
And then again, we have the Appalachian, Appalachian Prison Book Project, which focuses on being able to send books to inmates. You know, rewarding, valuable. Um, other questions? Hi, could you speak um, specifically to some of the barriers uh, that people face upon reentry when it comes to employment and housing, whether it's facing the box or, or different things and how that happens? I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I just finished my dissertation and one of the chapters was on this, so I, I'll speak about that. Um, you know, the collateral punishments, you know, to me, they're one of the biggest injustices in our system right now because they are direct punishment, but they're not issued out with your punishment. You know, like when you're sentenced, they don't tell you your license is going to be suspended for six months. They don't tell you all that. Um, Margaret Colgate Love, she was the pardon attorney for George Bush, and she came here, and I got to meet her once, actually, um, and, and <coughs> talk with her about some of this stuff. You can actually um, contact her, and she will directly send you a collateral punishments book that has rehabilitation certificates, collateral punishments for every state, like, and she will, she sent one to every facility in Hazleton uh, just, just because. Uh, you know, it is, to me, again, it's one of the biggest injustices. You know, a lot of people say, oh, Jerry, you're a great success story. No, I have a friend who did 10 years. She's been working three jobs since she's got out. She tried to go to, um, to radiology school in, in, in Maryland. They won't let you get licensed because you have felony conviction. You know, so that's a success story. So these collateral punishments, they're really what's, what's creating this vicious cycle um, because people don't know what they are. You know, I, when I walked out of prison, I had no clue what my collateral punishments were. I didn't even know they existed. You know, nobody tells us this. So going in and doing, order her book. Go in and do a class on collateral punishments in different in some of the state facilities. It would be huge because people just don't know. They don't know what they are, and they're different in every state. You know, so for example, Alderson does this amazing cosmetology program, fantastic. And I, they were walking me through there, and I said, "But do you check that their state's going to let them get licensed? Because you know." A lot of states will not let them get licensed because of the chemicals. West Virginia, West Virginia you can't get a barber's license. Yeah. Yeah. But they, so they can invest all this time in getting trained, which is an amazing program, but then they can't practice when they come out in their state. Yeah. You know? Another, another example of this, um, in Ohio, uh, you cannot get an HVAC license. However, one of the most popular um, programs in federal prison is HVAC. <laughs> So there's actually, I saw an article, I think it was maybe it was the Wall Street Journal, it was like about a year or two ago. It said across the board there was 46,000 hurdles to employment that are collateral consequences from incarceration. And they are just, some of them are, make no sense. And then the barber thing, I mean, if, especially if you're a barber in prison, like when you get out, you're like, no, no you can't do that. Right. <laughs> it cuts on one of them. Um. <laughs> And this is actually, so this is from um, the Justice Center, and it's a map for the whole country, but let's go to West Virginia, <laughs> and you can click on it, and it shows you all the collateral consequences, 86 pages, um, so it's 48,000 total entries, and then you can uh, narrow it down by category, employment, licensing, business licensing, government loans, judicial rights, education, political and civic participation, um, and you can also narrow it by um, whether they're mandatory and then misdemeanor or felony. Um, so helpful, helpful website. Yeah, the irony about this is that when uh, the rules of criminal procedure, when they do the guilty plea, one of like the categories is that you are supposed to know all the, all the, conse all the collateral consequences for you to accept the plea, and they ask you that question, and you say, oh yes, I've been told. <laughs> You have no clue. And this is not it. No clue. I mean, the amount of people that have to go to homeless shelters because they can't go into public housing, you know, and that alone you know, turns a lot of people back into a vicious cycle. So this stuff, it didn't exist when I came out, but it's, uh, it's such a huge resource. Yeah, what's making things worse right now is that currently um, I've noticed that, and other people have noticed too, that the um, halfway houses are quietly being closed. They're just not renewing their contracts. Um, 16 of the federal, out of the 172 of them, 16 have been closed this year alone, and they're just not renewing their contracts, and so people are going to have to max out their time. So if you have somebody who 
is homeless that probably would have been able to get a start. Like the Wheeling Halfway House was closed. Um, what was it, a month ago? September 30th. Yeah, it was closed a month ago. 98% uh, of the people were employed. I mean, so it, and the cost of housing somebody in a federal halfway house is like $29 a day, and to have them incarcerated is $31 a day, like a, the BOP statistics. I, I mean, I might be off by a dollar. But they're basically the same, and it's a little bit more expensive to have someone incarcerated than to have someone in a halfway house. But now they're not going to have halfway houses. It looks like that's just going to start to be phasing out, and no one was saying boo about it, and people were getting denied a halfway house time, and they have to do it full time. And now people are like looking at literally going to shelters immediately coming out of prison because they have mm -hmm. no way to plan for those resources. So, I mean, it's there's a lot of stuff going on that is just making it worse, and that's why some of us in this industry are just you know, scared. Like, because it's not it's not looking like it's getting better. Yeah, so. if your option is the streets, why not stay where you are, right? I mean, some places it's easier, yeah. you know. And I'm not I'm not supporting that. But you know, when we when we're looking at you know a, the recidivism rate that we have, um, you know, it shows that that's exactly what's happening in a lot of ways. For the law students out there, I'll just also say on this point that collateral consequences are considered ancillary civil fines. They aren't considered criminal punishments. This has been held by the Supreme Court of the United States. So therefore, there is no ex post facto prohibition prohibition, and therefore, it doesn't matter what you know on the day that you're sentenced. Whatever laws are put in effect until the day you die apply to you if, if you have felon status. Mm -hmm. So that's an ongoing thing where you can accumulate more and more penalties as you go through life no matter what, no, no matter what kind of life you're leading. So that's also an interesting aspect uh, about these kinds of penalties. But deportation now is considered a, an actual criminal the deportation is because of the Padilla, because of the Padilla, Padilla case. versus Kentucky, yeah. yeah. So, okay. so your attorney, you do need to be aware of your immigration consequences for taking a plea. Yeah. If your defense attorney that's doesn't true. make you aware, that that's ineffective assistance of <laughs> counsel for the law students here. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> this is going to be a hard one. Uh -oh. <laughs> you get this. this is one of our yeah, criminal yeah, yeah. procedure yeah. professors here, time, John Taylor. My time is up. <laughs> so I had a question for uh, Mr. Thompson, and, and, and others may have something to say about it as well. I was really struck by your stories of these people who took this long bus ride, I guess, to these supermax prisons, and people saying, you know, my kid's been in prison for 20 years, and I've seen him, like, twice or whatever. Um, and I gather part of the deal is that there are fewer of these facilities and the distances are longer and these people don't have any resources and all that. So anyway, it just, that it just struck me as an incredible thing. And then I asked myself this question, and not that this is an adequate substitute, but you know, in the modern world of technology and so forth, do the, is any effort made to say, well, you may, maybe you could Skype with somebody on your visit interval? And my guess is the answer to that is that nobody does that, but am I, but am I wrong, because it seems like that would be at least a little bit helpful. Uh, uh, um, I'm not an adequate substitute by any means, but I wondered, is that even being done, given well, all the yeah. crazy things would you all try? Would you consider $25 for 15 minutes on a Skype call like, adequate? That's, that's the way it works? Yes. Yeah. It's very expensive. Very expensive. Wow. Very expensive. Um, yeah. I mean, and right now, like, uh, like if, if you get like a local number, a 15-minute phone call will cost you like, what, like $3.15, but if you don't have a local phone number, it's like, like $10, $15. I mean, it's like, so you're, you're, you're making these huge uh, impositions on people that don't even have money to begin with. Sure. So, yeah, as a practical way, uh, yeah, it just doesn't happen. I mean, there's a couple places I've seen Skype, but what, what we're afraid of is that if they install these technological solutions to solve this problem that you've identified, then they'll stop the in-person visits. <laughs> Which people wow. are very hard to get, like it's hard to right. get to because, oh, you're bringing drugs. Or, oh, no, I mean, it's like the, the, they don't like them in the first place, uh, like the in-person visits, because it's just, they, and they, they're just awkward. I mean, like they, they make you sit next to each other. They don't allow you to hold hands anymore in some places. Um, and uh, this is a, there's, there's a huge number of like, you know, restrictions that make the in-person visits bad, but at least you get to hug and kiss right at the, the beginning of the end. But the, the one thing that we are like kind of afraid of with the Skype thing is one, it will be cost prohibitive and it will take away the one thing that people currently have. So, double-edged sword. Did you have one? Um, I was 
at least like the part of why those prisons are located where they're located. I mean, that's probably a whole nother panel. Um, why two state facilities are located 30 miles apart from each other in the middle of nowhere, I mean, not middle of nowhere, but in Wise, Virginia, as far away as it is. I mean, it's economic, jobs. Um, I think they're building another prison in Letcher, Kentucky. That's a federal facility. Um, here recently, I know there's been a lot of controversy around that issue. Um, but why are they building all those prisons? Um, it's a rhetorical question in those areas like that. Never panel, never day. <laughs> if I could say one thing that um, yeah, it, the, the distance from your family. Uh, I think if in the feds it's 500 air miles. Air I'm miles. <laughs> yeah, air miles. Um, but I wanted to, I, I would be sitting here not doing uh, justice for the women incarcerated because they're only 7%. Um, and their facilities are so far strung out. I mean, I, I was incarcerated with people from, women from Puerto Rico. You know, like the distance that women, and this is in direct relation to their children. You know, so if you, if you want to hear some heart-wrenching stories about separation from kids, you go into a women's facility where they're, uh, you know, across the country from their children and haven't seen them in six years, you know, because the kids can't travel that far. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, that to me is one of the biggest injustices in the system, uh, it, it, them not trying to put people near, with, with kids specifically, you know, yeah, I'm glad I got to see my mom because she was five hours away, but if I had children, you know, like there, there should be some mandating of distance so that the kids can get there, and there just isn't. And it's also guidelines. There's plenty of people that are outside of the classroom that are. Yeah, yeah, and you know, because Al down in Aliceville, what was it, a, a tornado hit Aliceville? facility down there and they shipped everybody to Hazleton. You know, you know, that's that beats it right there. We have time for one last question. Well, thank oh great. <laughs> um, I will actually say I think I um, heard that Louisiana recently was saying, okay, we'll let you have these video conferences and we're taking away the in-person. So it actually oh, really? is happening. Oh, okay. I saw a news article about that recently. The, the other thing is, is so, so uh, I mean, there are a lot of, of, of crazy things I didn't know that have come out that are, that are disturbing. Uh, um, Jen, your thing about the way that the veterans' benefits work and the different rules in terms of stripping people of benefits under much different and 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 more penalizing standards and with other, I, I, I am really really shocked by that, um, and I've got intuitions about what the answer to this is going to be, but but I'm just curious what your thoughts are on how in the world that state of affairs came to exist, given the <laughs> rhetoric of we've asked these people to sacrifice themselves for us and we're going to take care of them and all that. It just seems it just seems almost, un well, it, it does seem unbelievable to me, and I'm, and I'm really shocked by it. So I was just curious your thoughts on how it came to be that way. This never existed in American law until October of 1980, uh, and what had happened is in the, uh, s the previous summer, a, a gentleman serial killer from um, New York City named David Berkowitz um, had been captured by police and was incarcerated. He, he, he uh, was not on veterans benefits. He, he actually got on SSDI uh, as a function of his insanity defense um, while he was in prison, and this was splashed across the Chicago Tribune and all over the country, and everybody in Congress went nuts going, people are on SSDI in federal prison and they're Oh, the social security disability, right? Uh, in federal prison, we have to, str and then these other stories of this guy's a child molester and he's on DI. This guy got DI because he got in a fight with a prison guard. This guy got DI because another inmate took his head and smashed it, and all the, because DI rules are totally separate. And w the, the, they passed that bill, and the, some of the committee, committee members were 
that were on that committee were on Veterans Affairs and they had to cut the budget that year. It was a terrible budget year for VA and they slipped a bill through to take veterans benefits away and not a single example of any of these folks were veterans for obvious reasons. You can't get veterans benefits for a disability that doesn't occur in service during honorable service to the country. So they couldn't have been roped in with these people factually. I actually wrote a whole paper about this that I'll send to you. But thank you for the question. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. <laughs> thank you to our thank wonderful you. panelists. And if you have questions, please feel free to come. <laughs> take food. We have a, a small reception in the back, so please enjoy the food and take a look at the, the photos from the Divide exhibit.